So today we are going to be doing the opening lab for uh, this last month, January of 2022. And uh, this is something I do once a month for our uh, some of our Patreon subscribers, um, where I put up a post and people send in opening questions um, of all kinds. And then I sometimes do some research and answer the questions uh, on this stream. So yeah, we have a number of good questions this time around. And I won't be able to get to any like new questions, but if you have a question that's, you know, on the opening being discussed or on the position at hand, um, that's totally, totally fine. Um, and uh, yeah, actually, let me load my notes here as we get into uh, the first question. Alrighty. And uh, yeah, so first question is from David Stewart, who's asking, uh, I'm a D4, C4 player as white, and I have some plans against the more usual black responses, QGD, QGA, Slav, QID, BOGO, but I'm thoroughly confused by D4, Knight of 6, C4, C5. Uh, I think I should play 3, D5, but I'm lost as to where to go from here feel overextended and behind in development, but at the same time, I don't think letting black play C takes D4 is right either. Yeah, um, David, absolutely. So let's put it on the board. D4, Knight of six, C4. And uh, the question was about what to do in response to C5. So yeah, if we think about what white is trying to achieve in the opening, which is to control space and, and develop pieces to their best squares, uh, white pretty much has to play d5 here if they want to be, let's say, uh, as ambitious as possible. You could also play a move like knight f3. This isn't a bad move and lots of players uh, play like this, but I think I, I definitely wouldn't recommend it for most players. I would suggest if you're a d4, c4 player, you should play ambitiously, you should fight for the advantage, and you should take space um, if it makes sense to do so, which in this case, I think it does, because this pawn can definitely be supported with knight c3 and e4, and so it's not going to be overextended. So generally, when black plays this way, they're going into either a, a Benoni or a Benko type of opening. So there's the Benko Gambit with b5, uh, which is something that d4 players uh, will definitely have to reckon with. And here Black's idea is to sacrifice a pawn after c takes b5, a6. And I think it's a very uh, fun opening, an interesting opening for, for Black to play. White does get a very, very healthy extra pawn. It's not a pawn that Black is going to win back anytime soon. Um, but in return, one day Black will be able to create some nice pressure against the queen side with the bishop on g7, this rook eventually reaching the b8 square and... Um, yeah, typically black gets very reasonable play. It's something like this. White plays e4, has to uh, move the king here. It's not such a big deal. White's king usually ends up like on g2, for example. We get some position like this, and yeah, black gets some nice compensation with uh, the pieces on the queen side. But white should also be happy with their extra pawn and should be trying to play a4 and slowly improving their position on the, the queen side. Uh, and just trying to use the extra pawn as best as they can. So this is one opening that black uh, often goes into. And then you also have e6, which takes us more into uh, the Benoni, which is kind of known for this position or this kind of structure, um, which is asymmetrical. White gets a bunch uh, more pawns in the center and on the king side, and black gets this like queen side majority that they're trying to push. And uh, yeah, this position is also considered nice for white, but Definitely very, very double-edged and very playable for uh, for both sides. Um, and uh, yeah, there are different ways uh, white can develop here. I'll make a couple of suggestions. Um, plans with like h3, knight f3, and bishop d3 are generally considered very, very solid. Um, if you want to be really aggressive, you can play f4. Um, but based on David's question, I don't think he wants to be super, super aggressive in the opening. I think he just wants to uh, to get the pieces out. So I would say something like this, h3, to stop black from being able to use the g4 square, and then playing like knight f3, bishop d3, castles, and I think white gets some uh, very, very natural development here. If black plays a6, the general rule of thumb in this kind of position is to play a4 and prevent black from advancing uh, on the queen side with b5. 
And uh, yeah, it's it's a very, very dynamic structure. White has, I think, uh, a lot more play in the center and the typical plan is to try to play for e5 with like bishop f4, rook e1, or with the f pawn somehow. And um, yeah, I think this is the way to do it. Uh, it's not the easiest position to handle. These positions are filled with like tactics and dynamics and they're very, very tricky. Uh, personally, I don't think I score that great against <laughs> the Benoni as a d4 player. Um, but ultimately, it's not something to to shy away from uh, as white. If you're a d4, c4 player, that means your philosophy should be all about taking space and fighting for the center. If that's not what you want to do, if you'd rather be like playing for the initiative, you know, and, and focusing on development, then I think, well, e4 might be a, a better move to, to play. But um, for anyone that's looking to like control the game and like build on the space advantage, definitely this is, I think, the, uh, the way to do it. Um, yeah, absolutely. Okay, um, so hopefully that answers that question, David. And uh, yeah, let's go to the next one. And let's see, let me make sure that this is sized up correctly. Cool, I think I got it. Okay. So next question comes from Dean. And uh, Dean's asking, as black, I studied a couple of lines on the Trumpowski from Fide Master uh, Picta's King's Indian course, uh, just so that I wasn't completely unprepared. However, I don't fully understand them yet. After d4, knight f6, let's put that on the board. Bishop g5, d5, bishop takes f6, e takes f6, and we'll look at it from black's point of view. Um, there are a lot of different ideas, but often black's bishop comes to d6, the remaining knight goes out to d7, and sometimes black tries to establish a light square blockade with f5 and possibly h5 and g6. This setup is not intuitive to me at all, and I often get pressured down the middle after an eventual c4, dc4 where white has two central pawns and uh, black has doubled uh, pawns on the f-file and a pawn on c6. Yeah, I know this exact structure, Dean, so we can definitely discuss this one. Um, so what are some general strategic ideas for black to get play with these kind of structures and imbalances? So yeah, this is a, a really, really solid setup for black. It's one that I've um, played uh, a bunch of times um, in Blitz. Not so much in Classical, but that's mainly because the Trumpowski is like just not super, super popular, um, but it is, I think, a bit more popular online. Um, and yeah, I think this is a very, very solid setup, although it, it is a little counterintuitive because generally black, okay, you can start with c6 or play bishop d6 here. Um, at some point, white is going to play c4 usually, and the idea for black is to take this one. Playing c6 would kind of leave black with a pawn that's hard to defend on d5 in the long run as white can play like queen b3 and even g3 bishop g2 and i guess the fundamental strategy that or thing behind this position that's important to recognize is that okay black has the two bishops white has two knights and, and a bishop and that also means that white has kind of extra pieces that can fight on the light squares so the last thing that black wants is some kind of fixed weakness on a light square because basically white has more pieces that can attack this one, seeing as how black's bishop on d6 can never defend this pawn. So this is kind of the danger that black is trying to avoid by taking on c4. And although it looks like black has given up the center, the point is that um, it's still actually a very fluid position. And because black has the two bishops, it makes it really hard for white to actually achieve anything. As soon as white starts pushing pawns, then they kind of create weaknesses in, in open lines. Um, so the move order here, I think, is not too important. But in general, black is going for this kind of setup with f5 and c6. And um, typically, we get some kind of position like this. And it is different moves. But again, this is just kind of like a sample line. And uh, yeah, essentially, it's even though white has a nice center, it's very hard for them to push e4. It's really hard for them to push d5 without kind of giving up some dark squares. And black's position is very flexible, and you can 
put your pieces kind of on natural squares like queen e7, bishop d7 makes sense, g6 here is a move that's uh, quite useful. And there are different plans of improving the position, like playing rook e8 and knight e4 is kind of classic. Um, another idea I just kind of want to point out as, uh, yeah, I've had this, like, almost this exact position, I think, many, many times, because both sides, they just develop naturally, and you get something that looks like um, looks like this. Maybe throwing g6 in is useful, or, or bishop d7 um, at some point. Um, and uh, the point is white often goes for this plan with, like, a3 and b4. And a nice way to deal with this one, because white is trying to do some kind of, like, minority attack, is to actually just shut this down with uh, b5. And uh, black's bishops, I think, are actually very nicely poised to support this idea. So the point behind b5 is once white moves somewhere, bishop d3 or bishop b3, then black is then playing a5 and targeting white's weakness on the dark squares, where black, of course, has a very, very strong bishop. Um, so anything like this, actually, I think is very, very nice for black, is again, it's actually hard for white to really do much, but we now have a very, very clear target. And the c6 pawn, although it looks weak, actually really hard for white to put any pressure on it. And we always have like rook fc8 and this kind of thing. So this is a pretty typical uh, motif to kind of engage in counterplay on the queen side. It's also something black can think about if white does not push b4. You can definitely think about playing like b5, a5 and, and trying to uh, improve your position um, that way. Um, another plan I think that's kind of interesting for black, I saw... Uh, kind of interesting game. This was like online blitz game uh, played by uh, uh, Grandmaster Eric Hansen, who's a strong player. And I think he's played this system multiple times, so clearly seems like it's something he, he believes in. And I just kind of like how he handled this position. So he played this move a6 kind of early. I'm not sure what's the difference exactly between a6 and c6. I think maybe if white goes for like a queenside castles plan, then a6, b5 and putting the bishop on b7 might be a little bit more active here. But in any case, we get a very similar type of position because white castles kingside, black goes g6, rook fd1, knight f6, rook ac1, c6, a3, queen e7, g3, king g7. And this move is not necessary for white, but it's kind of a typical move to try to restrict the darks for bishop. Um, and now black eventually plays for this idea. I think it was mentioned in Dean's question with h5. And yeah, just a very natural way of putting pressure uh, against white's uh white's king side and uh for me it's kind of just like a slow slow rolling attack that black has in this kind of position the rook can swing over to h8 you have the play on the h file and um yeah the queen side actually is is pretty solid the bishop can drop back to c7 and it's actually really hard for white to make uh, a serious headway um and uh this game okay it was just a blitz game but i thought it was kind of instructive how it went um, h4, black could have also kept the bishop, takes, takes, bishop g2, takes, takes, and um, already here, black had enough uh, of a follow-up to, to sack, takes, queen takes, and uh, he takes this one, the knight is coming into g4, and black's attack here was like already uh, super, super strong. So, um, yeah, I think uh, hopefully that kind of helps give you at least uh, some ideas of what to play for in these kinds of positions. Um, like I mentioned, I think they're they're very, very solid and very playable for black. And um, the different move orders here are not too, um, not too important. For example, like some players, they like to be tricky here and play like maybe queen c2 to kind of go after this pawn. Um, but there are many ideas for black, like this one, knight d7, where you just like leave the pawn hanging with the point that queen takes f5 get, gets uh, met with knight e5 and black has tactics like this. So I've always liked this line because actually you don't even have to be that careful about the move order. You can literally like hang this pawn on f5 but it actually like oftentimes just works out <laughs> just fine which I think is uh, is pretty cool. Um, and then as long as you're generally familiar with your setup and some of the ideas as hopefully we now are I think black has actually very, very uh, few issues in, in a structure like this. Um, now, some players play the trump in a different way. They'll go like g3, for example, and they'll hold off on this c4 move, and they'll play a position like this. And um, this one, I think, is also very reasonable. And again, I think black should kind of rely on this f5 
knight f6 setup. So something like this, I think, is pretty typical. And um, yeah, there are different ways here. I think it's often fine for black to take. You can also consider playing um, bishop e6 with the idea of taking back on the d5 square with pieces. Uh, again, what we don't want usually is like some kind of fixed structure where this pawn can just be very, very easily targeted. Um, but using the using pieces on the d5 square, I think, gives black um, generally a very, very reasonable position. And then you just have this very simple plan always of g6, h5 to try and target and just slowly weaken this uh, this g3 square and slowly build up on, on the king side. So, um, yeah, uh, hopefully that, that helps, Dean. That's how I kind of see these positions, and I'm, I'm happy to enter them pretty much... Uh, pretty much any day. This is the line that I would um, happily play against the Trompowski. You can also play G takes F6 here for a more like dynamic set of positions. We won't really get into it now, but these are also absolutely fine for black and yeah, a definite option um, as well. Alrighty. So next question comes from Laurent, who uh, is asking about a particular line after e4, e5. So Laurent says, I played twice in long time controls against the line uh, e4, e5. Knight f3, knight c6, knight c3, g6. d4 takes, takes, bishop g7. So Laurent mentions this can also rise through a uh, scotch move order. And here white uh, goes bishop e3, knight f6, takes, takes, e5, knight g8, f4, knight e7. Okay, at this point I had two difficult games. Number one where white played bishop c4, castles queen f3, I think I have it here, d6, queenside castles, bishop e6, bishop b3. And I struggled to find a plan while well, white can increase the pressure with uh, with knight e4. And then uh, number two, I guess he had another game with queen f3, d6, bishop c4, bishop e6, takes, takes, castles, castles, queen h3. Yeah. Do you have any suggestion to get at least some play in these lines as black, even if they happen to be objectively bad for black? Um, okay. Yes. <laughs> Um, I did take a look at this one, and I think I found at least a, a playable solution for, for Laurent. Um, I, I won't sugarcoat it. it. It's a very, very sketchy line, for sure. But I think I, I did find some solution. Um, now, my first idea was to uh, try to avoid this e5 and f4 thing, because it seems like Black is losing so much time and white is developing so quickly here. So I was thinking, you know, why not just play d6 in this position? Then you can get your knight out to f6, castles, rook e8, and you can kind of play this dynamic uh, position. But then I realized that probably what black is playing for with knight f6 is to meet a move like queen to d2 with castles, castles, rook e8, and uh, the point of leaving this pawn back on d7 and not playing d6 is to be able to play d5 in, in one move, something like this, like f3, d5. It's kind of similar to like the accelerated dragon, you have ideas like this, and it uh, makes a lot of sense because black gets some, some really nice, nice play in, in this position. So my guess is that that's probably not really a suitable solution to just play d6 because then you're kind of giving up um, a lot, I think, as black in this position. So... I tried to make this one work, and I do think this whole thing is playable, but I would suggest this move knight h6, not knight e7, knight h6. Um, so the point of this one is, okay, the knight can jump to f5 and g4 at some point, and I saw this was played by some strong player uh, in a blitz game, so I kind of, you know, took a closer look at it, and... Uh, yeah, black also wants to play d6 and put pressure on uh, the e7 pawn, and this knight helps defend f7, which isn't a super huge deal as black is going to castle. But I think this one is, is actually very, very playable. So if white goes bishop c4, then black castles, and uh, after queen f3, for example, 
uh, black goes d6 and gets a lot of pressure on e5. Um, you can check with the, the computer like this pawn is hanging, but black gets some very nice counterplay with like bishop d7, rook b8. And uh, in the meantime, it's not really clear where white's king is going to be super safe. Uh, another thing to watch out for is that the knight al always wants to jump to g4 once d6 is played and uh, target the, the bishop, especially if white castles kingside. So I think black gets some very, very nice dynamic chances here. Um, there was a, the high level game actually had uh, Jeffrey Zhang playing as white and uh, he played castles in this position, which I don't think is the best move. So he was probably probably caught off guard because this whole thing, you know, I think what Laurent is trying to do with playing this system with uh, G6 is my guess is, you know, trying to get a dynamic position against people who play like the scotch or the four knights. Because of course black can just play here and, and go for these positions, but they're very dry and if you're trying to play for a win, it's definitely not so easy here. Um, so I, I think that's what Laurent's idea is with this line, is to just try to get something a little bit more combative. Um, and yeah, definitely this feels like uh, kind of what black should be, should be aiming for. Um, so... Yeah, actually, in this aforementioned game where Jeffrey Zhang was was white, he went bishop c4, black castled, he castled, black played d6, uh, he played queen f3, and, uh, and now actually black should have just hit him with knight to g4. Of course, it was a blitz game, so, you know, whatever, he, he probably missed it. But this move is very annoying for white because black wants to take the dark square bishop. This is a very, very important piece for the position. If black takes this bishop, then... Our bishop on g7 is just super, super strong, and this can be worth, you know, a pawn or two pawns in, in many cases. Um, and of course, black is also threatening to just take on e5 and start grabbing material. So it's kind of hard for white to, to hold everything together. Black also has like rook b8 in the position to just add some pressure. And yeah, I think black is already just uh, slightly better. So yeah, this seems, uh, I think, a really kind of tricky way to play the position. White does have one way to get an objective advantage but uh, the thing is they have to kind of find a lot of moves and then even then it's not easy so that's why i kind of like this line as uh like a surprise weapon um so the only move white can play to get an advantage is queen f3 and then black should castle and then white should castle queen side so if they go bishop c4 which is very very natural and a move that a lot of players uh, play then after d6 black is already getting decent counterplay um, because note that castles here can often be met with bishop g4, so this is kind of a, a problem for white. But if white uh, castles first, then if black plays d6, white is in time to, to go h3, and black is under a lot of pressure and, and can't use the square. So instead I think black should go d5, uh, again threatening bishop g4, so white should play h3, and very important move f6. If black doesn't play this move, then black is going to be really much worse here. White can go g4. Knight a4, knight c5, just kind of clamp down on everything, and, and black will be just super passive and having a bad position. So black has to play f6 very, very quickly. And here, if white wants to actually get an advantage, they have to play the move, uh, not e takes f6, excuse me, bishop c5. And they have to go after the exchange. And, uh, okay, this is not exactly an easy move uh, to make but it's important for white, otherwise black is just taking and getting a lot of counterplay. If e f6, then queen takes f6, and this position I think is very, very playable for black with pressure on the long diagonal, you have like rook b8 ideas, it just looks like a very, very fun dragon. So only way for white here is bishop c5, uh, and then my suggestion is for black to just play bishop e6 and just sacrifice the exchange, like takes, takes, and e f6, queen takes f6, for example, and uh, okay, you're down in exchange, but uh, white had to find so many moves <laughs> to get to this point that I think it's still kind of worth the risk. And even this position, I would argue, is definitely not easy for white to play. This is the type of exchange sacrifice where you get the unopposed dark square bishop in a position with opposite sides castling. Black has a very, very obvious counterplay here on the dark squares. And uh, you're down material, but it's, you know, you have one bishop against one rook. It's still piece for piece. It's not like you're down a piece. Being down in exchange is a very, very different thing. 
And uh, yeah, well, you can't really play this opening without taking on a certain amount of risk. So this this is where I would uh, what I would choose if I really really wanted to to play this line as black. Personally, if I play e4 e5, then I'm probably just going to go for like the solid stuff against the four knights, like with knight f6 and, and bishop b4. But if you really really want to make this line work, then I think this is a decent try because it's going to be a nice surprise weapon. And of course, white has to find a number of only moves to uh, secure, you know, uh, an advantage. And even then, that position, I think, is really, this position, really not easy for, for white to handle. Uh, especially in the, like, okay, blitz and rapid setting, like, 100%. Like, you have your ideas, you have knight f5, rook b8, bringing the knight back to d6, looking for play on the diagonal. And, uh, yeah, very, very sharp and uh, interesting position for, for black to play. Um, so this is my recommendation. Of course, it's uh, overall a pretty risky line, but I think that's kind of what Black is signing up for. So um, yeah, definitely definitely worth worth trying out if we're looking to take uh, a lot of risk and uh, try to get the opponents out of book, you know, quite early on. Um, but uh, yeah, this kind of chess can be very fun. Of course, there's a limit to like how many times you can play it. <laughs> Once people catch on or people have time to prepare for you, then you might have to be more solid. But if there's no time to prepare for the opponent or yeah, you know that yeah, the opponent is not ready for this one, then definitely this is a very, very uh, playable thing to do. Um, okay, let's go to the final question, which comes from Kirk. And Kirk is asking about the Evans Gambit. All right, let's put it on the board. So e4, e5, uh, bishop c4, bishop c5, and b4. And uh, Evans Gambit with five bishop c5. So black takes, white pushes c3. Now black has a lot of moves here, like bishop a5, bishop b7, but bishop c5, d4, e takes d4. And what would I recommend then? C takes d4, which results in a nasty bishop b4 check, or castles, and then if d takes c3, uh, I think is meant then bishop takes f7, followed by queen to d5 check. Um, okay, so yeah, I definitely had to look this one up because I'm not um, much up on, on the Evans Gambit details. But yeah, it seems like white does have a very clear choice after c3, bishop c5, d4 takes in exactly this position, whether to castle or to take on d4. Um, long story short, I think both the moves are playable. They just kind of allow black different ways of going wrong. So after c takes d4, I kind of think black should play bishop b6 in this position and uh, and actually not, uh, not give the check. Um, but let, let's back up. Actually, let's start with this one. Let's say white castles, because I agree, allowing this check at first glance does seem uh, unpleasant as black gets a nice tempo. Um, and if on castles, if a lot of your opponents are going d take c3, then I would say just stop here. You should play this one because dc3, I think, is a really serious mistake in the position um, because the, these lines with bishop takes f7, queen d5, and queen takes c5, these are really, really nice for white. Uh, you're still going to be a pawn down once you win back the pawn on c3. But uh, black has lost their castling right. You have a position with opposite color bishops where your bishop is extremely strong on the long diagonal. And uh, once white just gets the pieces out, like knight e2, rook e1, and, and starts attacking on the king side, it's a very, very nice position for white. So uh, if on castle you, you're getting a lot of opponents taking on c3, I would definitely just go for this one and happily happily play this position all day long uh, as white, because this one is, is really, really nice. What black should do against castles is just allow white to take the pawn and play something like d6, and then you get a position like takes, and I think knight c3 here is typical. Black usually goes knight e7, because knight f6, I think e5 is probably uh, an issue, and uh, bishop a3 stuff. So black usually goes knight e7 here, and then white can play like rook e1 and h3, or maybe h3 first. And uh, it's a very decent position. You have compensation for the pawn. Bishop can come out to b2. You have a nice center. And I think this is where I think a big battleground is currently happening um, in, in the Evans, in, in this line. 
Um, although black, both both sides have have other options um, as well. So this one is very very playable, and uh, it might be the easiest choice because other than d6, black doesn't really have a whole lot else they can do here. Like if knight f6 here, I think this is a mistake as well because you're taking this one with tempo, um, and then you can push e5 here as well. And this typical counter of d5 doesn't really work in this position because white can take and go rook e1 check. And on bishop e6, there's going to be d5. I think just takes first and, and then d5. And yeah, black is uh, just losing material here. So this is not really, this would not really be playable for black here. White just gets a huge attack right off the bat. So you're really putting a lot of pressure on black to kind of find this only move, d6, or they can go bishop b6 first and then play d6, and then you get this kind of playable position that you should be okay with as uh, Evan's Gambit player. Okay, so hopefully that is clear. Now the other option is to just take first, and then if black plays bishop b6, then essentially we just get the same position that we just looked at. So you might be thinking, well then, this one doesn't really make a whole lot of sense because it allows black to give bishop b4 check while we allow this extra option. But actually this one might not be that great after this move knight to d2. So this move seems pretty strong for white. The key point or the key idea here is that you're trying to push d5 very, very quickly. So here main move for black is to play uh, knight f6. Um, if d6, then you have ideas like d5 and black has to watch out uh, for, for queen a4 check. Uh, so this is uh, this is a problem. So generally black has to go knight of six here. And uh, now if you play e5, then d5 is totally fine for black because we don't have any tactics with e takes f6 and this pawn is just fantastic and black is gonna get knight e4 in. This is absolutely okay. But instead white does have d5, which is a little bit counterintuitive, but it is pretty strong because you're chasing this knight first and then eventually playing for e5. And yeah, actually, I think white is just getting an edge here. Like uh, if knight a5, for example, then castles, and let's say knight takes c4, knight takes c4, now white is playing for e5. There are some, uh, like, computer tactics here. For example, on knight takes e4, white goes queen d3, f5, and d6, which I thought was just a fantastic idea. But this might be worth looking into a bit. Or you might say it's not worth it, and then you don't really have to bother. You can just play castles earlier and, and avoid all this. But this is a very, very cool, cool sacrifice because it really shuts down black's development. And then after like bishop takes d6, takes, takes, I think queen d5 here is a very, very strong move, stopping black from castling. And white just has a fantastic attack and is already threatening moves like knight g5, which is kind of like a peace sacrifice but with the idea of getting uh, the rook into the game with rook a1 very quickly, and it's super, super dangerous um, for, for black. Um, but uh, even just a simple means like bishop b2, bishop a3, white just has like huge, huge attacking pressure here. Um, so this line I think is a little bit, a little bit tricky for white, and you have to be maybe familiar with some, uh, some tactical ideas, but objectively I think pretty, pretty strong. Um, if, for example, black takes on d2 first here, knight takes d2, knight takes c4, knight c4, you know, let's say black castles and, and tries to avoid grabbing more material, white is still doing very, very well in a position uh, like this with, with e5 here, and uh, just tons and tons of pressure on the on the diagonal, and yeah, I think maybe even just winning, winning the exchange here, or at least winning all the material back, and then just having a very, very nice dark sword bishop. So... Long story short, you could play uh, takes here, and uh, if bishop b6, then this is, okay, a normal position. So you give your opponent the chance to kind of mess up with bishop b4, because I think knight d2 is a very tricky idea for white, and you get a lot of play. Um, or you could play castles, and then hope your for your opponent to mess up here with something like d takes c3 or knight f6, basically anything other than d6 and, uh, and bishop b6. So this maybe is the simpler choice because either way, you're gonna have to play this position one way or another against someone who goes into this and is well prepared. But um, yeah, based on how much you really wanna put in time learning this line, you know, probably the simpler choice is to uh, is to just castle. As I'm sure you're gonna get a lot of players who take this one or go knight f6 or some other move 
that's not as good, and then you just get uh, a very nice uh, advantage right off the bat. Once again, this one I think is just very, very good for white with queen c3 and bishop e2 coming. So yeah, Kirk, I hope that helps. I don't think you have to spend a ton of time on the opening, so I would say just castle, go for this position, and uh, be ready to play with the, the big center. Of course, bishop c5 is not the most critical move, I think, these days against the Evans Gambit. So as you go up and up, you're probably going to get fewer and fewer players playing this one against you. So another reason not to spend a ton of time really trying to uh, to crack it. But yeah, just play castles and I think you have a, a pretty simple, simple life ahead of you there. Uh, okay, glad that helped. And uh, yeah, as always, uh, we do this once a month on Patreon where we put up a post uh, and ask for uh, questions. Um, but yeah, that is going to do it for this month's show. So thanks everyone for tuning in and I will catch you guys next time.